One day, my friend comes up and says, Hey, Munoz, hey, uh, would you like to wrestle? I'm like, nah, man. You guys wear tight leotards and touch each other in funny places, man. I'm good. He shoots in, picks me up two seconds flat, slams me on my back. I've been wearing a tight leotard ever since. <laughs> You know, Jordans were the, the shoes, you know, back then. And I got a pair of J's, and the very next school day, I hear to the right of me someone say, hey, yo, break yourself off from them J's. And I'm like, that doesn't sound right. Let me skirt away from that, right? And so I just felt like I was kind of looking over my back. And probably about a week later, as I was walking home, I had to pass through this area where I hear five people behind me, and they're on this path all the time. Didn't think anything of it. The footsteps got faster. Then I hear them running. Boom, they shoelace tackled me and started bullying me for the very things I had on my feet. I tried to get up, but I couldn't do anything. I was kicked, punched, kneed, elbowed, and couldn't do anything, nothing. They peeled the shoes off my feet, and I walk home barefoot and ashamed. I didn't want to tell anybody. How can this happen to me that I couldn't even defend myself, you know? And I didn't want to go to school, so I faked being sick. And finally, my dad says, you're not sick, go back to school. And I go, ah, no. So I go back to school, and I would go to a classroom and do my homework and didn't make eye contact with anybody for about a month or so. Finally, one day, my friend comes up and he says, hey, Munoz, man, where are them J's at? Yeah, man, I just didn't feel like wearing them today, man. And he just kept talking about it. Hey, man, where are them J's at, man? I wish I had some J's. Man, you're so lucky for Christmas you got J's. I'm jealous, blah, blah, blah. And finally, I just, I look at him and I'm like, hey, didn't feel like wearing my J's today, man. I had tears strolling down my face. And he steps back, puts his hands up and says, hey, man, all I want to know where your J's are at, man. Calm down. And I go, yeah, and so I told him the story, and my friend comes up and says, Hey, Munoz, hey, uh, would you like to wrestle? He said, I bet you I'd take you down in 10 seconds. I said, yeah, right. I'm 150 pounds, and you're barely 100 pounds. There's no way you're going to take me down. So I break down my stance, wiggling my fingers at him like I'm going to do magic or something, right? He shoots in, picks me up, slams me on my back, I'm like, man, if wrestling gives you superpowers like that, I want it. Wrestled all the way through till I was a senior and ended up becoming a two-time state champion, a high school national champ, take second at the junior nationals and took second in junior worlds. I ended up getting a full-ride scholarship to Oklahoma State University. I was a two-time national team member. I tried to make an Olympic team. That was what I wanted to do, but uh, God had different plans leave Oklahoma, come back to California. And there at UC Davis, I met Uriah Faber. And Uriah Faber introduces me to MMA. And he's like, hey man, you should fight. And I'm like, nah man, I'm good. I got a wife and four kids. I'm teaching, I'm coaching, I'm getting my master's. I said, one more thing on my plate, man. I, and probably my wife won't, won't allow me to do it either. So he says, why don't you come to a practice? And he brings me to a practice and the who's who at the UFC at the time is there. Randy Couture's there, Brandon Vera's there, Quinn Rampage Jackson, Tito Ortiz, Frank Trigg, James Irvin, Scott Smith. Like, these guys are sparring and my first sparring match was against Randy Couture and Uriah's like, double jab, double jab, double leg. And I'm like, what is a double jab, man? Like, <laughs> and I'm learning how to strike, you know, on the spot and he's getting ready to defend his belt in like three weeks. You know, I end up, you know, snapping Randy Couture's head back a little bit and Uriah like smacks me into to the chest he goes see bro i told you homie you could do this right that made the leap and a year later i was in the ufc the ufc man it's um it was awesome i would work sometimes six in the morning and come home at like 10 o'clock at night i moved down to southern california and we started a gym called rain training center and i ended up having like the likes of Anderson Silva, the Nogueira brothers, Fabricio Bergum, Bob Ballou, King Mo, Jake Ellenberg moves down here. So all these guys end up coming to being a part of my gym and just snowball from there. I 
actually was on a four or five winning streak. I was owning and operating my gym, coaching fighters, coaching kids, and trying to be a lead professional athlete. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff that was happening in my life. I was going 100 miles an hour. I wasn't really taking care of my body. I was redlining. In training, I noticed that my foot was hurting. But I'm gonna tough it out. And I would tape my foot up, or I'd wear shoes, just so that I wouldn't miss training. I went into a fight against Chris Weidman. Had the worst weight cut ever. After the first round, I noticed that my foot's hurting and didn't think anything of it. And I fake a shot and I try to go for overhand right. And boom, he struck me with the elbow. I was knocked out instantly. And I woke up in a pool of my own blood and don't remember anything of that night. I come back home and the doctor asks what's wrong and I said my foot's hurting and I broke my, my fifth metatarsal. My foot was broken. I had to sit out for over a year. Fighting was the way I was able to subsidize my gym and provide for my family and oh man, what am I gonna do now? I'm not fighting, you know, I resorted to food. And so I ate and I ate and I ate and, and I got big. 265 pounds and I fought at 185. It's not right, but you know, I'm a fighter and I cut weight for 28 years and kind of the victim mindset, you know, kind of want to wallow in my sorrow and not even do anything. It was a daily battle. End up getting a fight. I had to train and get back on track and had to go from obese back to beast. I definitely, it was a hard time in my life. I had to snap out of my mental state and to get in a routine and start countering my negative thoughts with positive thoughts. And for me, it was going to a men's Bible study, going to church, you know, going to our small group and making sure I'm plugged in and getting fellowship with people. And if I didn't have that, then I don't know where I would be right now. A year and two months later, I ended up fighting Tim Boach and came away with a victory that night, that being my best performance ever. You kind of look back what happened and all the events that led through your life, and I see God's hand upon it all. And now I can give people hope. The bullying incidents led me to choosing wrestling. And then wrestling led me to becoming a champion on the mat because I wouldn't be known today as the nicest guy in the UFC or the Filipino wrecking machine if what happened to me in the eighth grade didn't happen. I wouldn't have the ministry I have. Joy is a choice, you know, and so I'm thankful for it. I really am. I equate wrestling to life and wrestling to your spiritual life as well. If you're being held down in a certain circumstance, well, you gotta figure out a way out. You gotta figure out a way to rise above it. For anyone that's getting bullied today, I ask you to not be silent. When you're silent about being bullied, you're actually participating in the problem. Find the courage to be able to come out of your shell, make sure you're, you're in a place where you're thriving, to tell somebody about it, to be able to make a change, because if you don't change, nothing's gonna change. It's gonna be tough, but you gotta take the chance to make a choice to make a change. I'm Mark, the Filipino Wrecking Machine Munoz, and you're watching This Is Me TV.